right bracket chapter 14, our contemporary or contemptible society. But I know that there is no man on this earth who can call around him property, be he a merchant, tradesman, or farmer, with his mind continually occupied with, how shall I get this or that, how rich can I get, or how much can I get out of this brother or from that brother, and dicker and work, and take advantage here, and there no such man ever can magnify the priesthood, nor enter the celestial kingdom. Brian Young, J.D. 11, 297. The Saviour made a parallel between our generation and that of Noah's not, because of heavy rainfall or large ships but, because of the necessity for the whole world to be cleansed. The time has long passed for the latter-day saints to decide which course they wish to pursue following the worldly to their inevitable collapse and destruction, or seeking to obey the laws and principles of heaven which God has already given them. Brian Young described our conditions to Messiah Hancock, who said, P. Young conversed freely on the situation of the saints in the mountains, and said that he dreaded the time when the saints would become popular with the world right bracket, for he had seen in sorrow, in a dream, or in dreams, this people clothed in the fashions of Babylon and drinking in the spirit of Babylon, until one could hardly tell a saint from a black leg. Life of Messiah Hancock, pages 73-74. to Then Brian Young added. Many of this people, for the sake of riches and popularity, will sell themselves for that which will canker their souls and lead them down to misery and despair. It would be better for them to dwell in wigwams among the Indians than to dwell with the Gentiles and miss the glories which God wishes them obtain. I wish my families would see the point and come forth before it is too late, for oh, I can see a tendency in my families to hug the moth-eaten customs of Babylon to their bosoms. This is far more hurtful to them than the deadly viper for the poisons of the viper can be healed by the power of God, but the customs of Babylon will be hard to get rid of. I bid. Pages 73-74. The Apostle Orson Pratt also understood the traditions, customs and temptations of the Gentiles for he said. The Gentile God has great influence even over the saints, consequently it will take years to eradicate covetousness from our hearts as our president has told us that the law relating to a full consecration of our property would perhaps be one of the last right bracket laws that would be fulfilled before the coming of Christ. Much patience and forbearance will need to be exercised before the saints will get completely rid of their old traditions, Gentile notions, and whims about property, so as to come to that perfect law required of them in the revelations of Jesus Christ. J.D. 2 261 one of the principal objectives of the United Order was to protect the Mormon people from the catastrophic events that will befall the world. The saints had been warned and forewarned of the impending doom and collapse of Gentile Babylon. If the Mormon people will not take the precautions to separate themselves from the Gentile economic, social and moral system, they too will be destroyed in the great fall of Babylon. The Lord warned the saints of these judgments. Be diligent in keeping all my commandments, lest judgments come upon you, and your faith fail you, and your enemies triumph over you. DNC 136:42. And. Dot, 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 inasmuch as they keep not my commandments, and hearken not to observe all my words, the kingdoms of the world shall prevail against them. DNC 103:9. Babylon is a snare to Mormonism, it is a dangerous quicksand, innocent in appearance, but deadly to the unwary trespasser. Their politics, economy, education, morality and laws are diametrically opposed to the doctrines of the Lord. Right bracket even the Mormon church school system has been infiltrated by Gentilism. Brian Young University was established to refute these philosophies of the world, but according to Dr. Hugh Nibley, it has failed. We have enough and to spare at present in these mountains of schools where dot 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 the teachers dot 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 dare not mention the principles of the gospel to their pupils, but have no hesitancy in introducing into the classroom the theories of Huxley, or Darwin, or of Mill and the false political economy which contends against cooperation and the United Order. BYU Today, November 1982. But it is the economic evils of the world that are bringing some of the worst corruptions and practices among the Mormon people. Perhaps one of the greatest evils of our time is the vast inequity between the poor and the rich. Another evil which is unnecessary is the constant inflation depression cycle which is created for the benefit of the bankers. These situations are created they are not accidents. Today the Mormon people are being trained in the worldly crafts of banking, politics and law. Depressions are inevitable and the next major depression will be the worst. The saints should become aware of the causes and indicators leading up to a depression. 
there are several similarities between the conditions and events of the 1929 crash and those of our own time. Debt. Just prior to the Depression, personal income had an 88% obligation to debt. It is almost identical today. Housing. Home building and real estate sales slumped off. Today we are all aware of the great drop in home building and the sale of real estate. Inflated interest. Interest on loans doubled in only a few years. We have seen it more than double within the last few years. Auto production. Automobile production tapered off to 50% during the first half of 1929. This past year, 1982, only one American air company made a profit, another went bankrupt, and the rest lost money. Stock market rise. Wild speculation pushed the stock market to an all-time high. Today, 1983, we have just passed through the highest peak on the market. Many other parallels and similarities are evident. Even the best and most renowned economists say that we are headed for a depression of the worst possible kind. They are beginning to say the same things that prophets have foretold for centuries. The Great Depression of 1929 affected almost everyone, and when the stock market fell, it caught many who had invested with wild speculation and with borrowed money. The people who lost so heavily were unable to buy anything. This stopped production, which in turn caused layoffs. Wages went to the bottom. Unemployment continued until 25% of the workforce were looking for jobs. There were no food stamps, welfare payments, or unemployment checks. Anyone who had a mortgage on his home, car or farm, and lost his job, simply had those things taken away from him. Right bracket corn sold as low as 10 cents a bushel, and wheat went for 20 cents. Hogs arrived at Chicago stockyards and were bought for $3 per 100 pounds, and cattle at $5 a hundredweight which was too low to pay for the freight to get them there. Men of wealth suffered such losses that they sold apples on the street. In the cities, families doubled up in homes. On March 6, 1933, Franklin Roosevelt ordered a closing of all banks in the United States to prevent any more destruction or runs on them. Electric companies, railroads, newspapers and other companies made their own script which was honored by many businesses as money. People lived on $5 to $10 a week. Some lived in chicken houses, garages, or even tents. They stood in lines to buy a bowl of cereal for a penny. There were bread lines, soup lines, and people migrating in lines. Right bracket all along the railroad yards were hastily made shacks with men not just bums, but professional men who were searching for jobs or money, so they could provide something for their families who were struggling for survival. One girl passing by these shanty towns on her way to school said, that is when I learned that grown men cried from hunger, anger, loneliness and frustration. When people live in an inflationary period, everyone borrows on high interest, to the benefit of the bankers. When a depression hits, the people can't pay their debts, so the bankers foreclose. The people always lose and the bankers always win. The Lord gives a key to who possesses the power and control of the people. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him, he shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Jute. 28 colon 44 to 45. What really happened in 1929? Sheldon Emery explained. Bankers, the source of America's money and credit, had deliberately withheld $8 billion from circulation by refusing loans to stable and growing industries, stores, and farmers. At the same time they demanded payment on existing loans, so that money was rapidly taken out of circulation and was not replaced. America was put in a depression and in deep trouble. Goods were available to be purchased, jobs waiting to be done, but right bracket little money. 25% of the workers were laid off. Banks took possession of tens of thousands of farms and businesses on foreclosures. Billions for the bankers, Emery, page 4. But many years before the Depression, these bankers had manipulated their way into the United States government. Great wealth is great power. It not only can make paupers and slaves out of people, but it can buy good seats in politics, controlling businesses, judges, and the leaders of state and federal government. These national and international bankers gained their greatest victory in December of 1913. They carefully waited until the Christmas holidays, when most congressmen were gone, having their own congressmen available to vote for the Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve is a private banking house, but was so named to lead people into believing that it was a government agency. This is what resulted. 
the Federal Reserve, the international bankers, printed a billion dollars in money, which probably cost them about $500. Then they loaned it to the government with interest, and the government gave them $1 billion in bonds as security. Wars were created so the government borrowed more money from the bankers. After World War I and II, Korea and Vietnam, the American citizens are paying just the interest on this loan, and there is no hope of ever paying the principal. The government tells us how much money they owe, but they never tell us they are paying it to the big bankers. Right bracket There was also another benefit for the bankers. The bonds given to the reserve banks are solid assets. The US banking laws require only a 10% reserve for loans, so these bankers now loan out $10 billion, or up to 10 times the amount of the value of $1 billion in bonds, to private customers, with interest. All this goes on with the original cost of $500 in printing expenses for each $1 billion, Sheldon Emery said. The bankers who control the money at the top are able to approve or disapprove large loans to large and successful corporations, to the extent that refusal of a loan will bring about a reduction in the price that that corporation's stock sells for on the market. After depressing the price, the bankers agents buy large blocks of the stock, after which the sometimes multi-million dollar loan is approved, the stock rises, and is then sold for a profit. In this manner, billions of dollars are made with which to buy more stock. This practice is so refined today that the Federal Reserve Board need only announce to the newspapers an increase or decrease in their e-discount rate to send stocks up comer and down as they wish. Using this method since 1913, the bankers and their agents have purchased secret or open control of almost every large corporation in America. Using that control they then force the corporations to borrow huge sums from their banks so that corporation earnings are siphoned off in the form of interest to the banks. This leaves little as actual profits which can be paid as dividends and explains why stock prices are so right bracket depressed while the banks reap billions in interest from corporate loans. In effect, the bankers get almost all of the profits while individual stockholders are left holding the bag. Billions for the bankers, Emery, page 8-9. In 1913 another illegal and unconstitutional agency was pawned off on the American people the Internal Revenue Service. This was an agency created to collect money from the private earnings of the people, to pay off the debts created by wars, inflation and depression. When a war is not being created, then other manipulations are promoted to get the government into debt. Suddenly the government decides to give money away for foreign aid, easing tensions, increased relations, minority programs, disaster areas, military preparedness, and every other project down to and including the study of the breeding habits of the whooping crane anything to create more debt. And as if this weren't enough, the government began to go into business always losing money. Popular losses like Amtrak, land management and thousands of other businesses not only are always losing money, but operate in competition to private businesses who pay taxes to this giant competitor. The federal government now operates more than 25,000 corporate units competing with private enterprise. Most of these operate at staggering losses, even though they pay no property taxes. According to figures tabulated by the Liberty Amendment Committee, the federal government now owns more than 20% of all industrial properties, and some 40% of all the land mass of the United States. Right bracket the government owns, illegally and unconstitutionally, more land than is found east of the Mississippi River. As more and more land goes into government hands, that land comes off the tax rolls, and the owners of private land must make up the difference. Gradually federal controls are imposed on lands still held in private hands, in the form of land use and regional planning regulations. The city, county, and state laws are all being replaced by new federal laws and regulations. The object of good government is to protect the citizen in his rights of freedom, but today the government demands the freedom to take away the rights of its citizens. The work of the Lord is to bless, build, give, and help, but the devil always destroys, takes away, curses, and steals. Many government humanitarian projects are actually grafts. Our foreign aid only produces more countries to stand in line for handouts. Taxes are created to support more giveaway programs, and welfare which, in turn, only encourages more people to get welfare. If a thief meets a man on the street and takes his wallet, we call it robbery. But when the government takes money from a man, we call it legal. The difference is that the robber may never rob the man again, but the government is there every payday. 
no one knows what the robber does with the money he takes, similarly no one has ever been able to audit the internal revenue service. Right bracket money spent by some departments of the government is often diametrically opposed to that spent by other departments. For instance, one department will pay the farmers not to plant crops, while another agency pays for dams to help the farmer irrigate more land for more crops. One agency will spend billions for arms to destroy other countries then another department will spend billions to help rebuild them. One department is spending for peace another for war. One agency is taking money away from the people while another is giving it away to others. One is buying dairy products from the farmers to keep the prices high, another is giving the products free to the people who can't afford to pay those high prices established by government. Our political and economic experts are always blaming the people for the economic mess we are in. They blame the workers for inflation, the president for recession, and the American dollar for devaluation. These experts are always creating another remedy a new tax on gas, tires, autos, cigarettes or personal income. They say the answer to every problem is another tax they want to give us more of the medicine that made us sick in the first place. Many people are turning to the Constitution to help protect them in their rights against the monster that is eating them up. Over 22 million people are refusing to pay their income tax, and many millions of people are resorting to help from private churches, such as Universal Life Church, second largest church in the US. Others resort to every tax loophole available. But the government doesn't seem to get the message that the people are fed up with taxation, their foolish spending programs, and the unconstitutional agencies that are making thousands of these outlandish laws. Right bracket at the turn of the century, the national debt was in the millions, today it is a trillion. The average American paid no income tax, few other taxes, and had almost no debt. Today he pays over half his income into numerous taxes and debts. Just before the Federal Reserve was established in 1913, the federal debt was about $12 per citizen, but today it is nearly $4,000 per person. Owning your own home was the American dream and most people did. The average home today is valued at $80,000. To borrow the money and pay it back with interest, the homeowner will pay the bankers over $250,000 $170,000 of it goes for usury. If Congress would have followed the Constitution, creating their own money and regulating it, instead of trusting the bankers, there would be no national debt, nor $4 trillion in other debts. Money going into circulation would remain there, as the medium of exchange that it was meant to be. The theory is often advanced, both in public and private, that the borrowing of big money is the beginning of prosperity. The people have become educated to this misleading and fallacious idea. That one generation can assume the prerogative to borrow money and burden not only itself, but the subsequent one with debt, in order that it may establish some public convenience, necessity, or luxury, is apparent. Indeed, the greater part of our much-vaunted public prosperity today is but the spending of borrowed money. The United Order, Midgley, 16. Right bracket Jefferson once said that men are the agents of their own destruction, and debt is surely one of the fastest means towards that end. In fact, debt is disastrous. The loss of work or income, sickness, death or a multitude of calamities, can wipe out the profits of many years due to a small mortgage. It is to the super bankers that we owe our inflations, plunging stock markets, wars, depressions and foreclosures. It is through our national debts and national taxes that these greedy money makers have become the worst thieves of all time. They are the modern Gadianton robbers. These plundering pirates have reduced the world into poverty, war and death, in their quest for money. We are victims of sorrow and grief because of their swindling extortions. The treasuries of many nations are being bled dry by these economic vampires, who sap money from the poor and middle classes, until their wealth is gone, and their will to work is broken. With taxes upon taxes, they have created a huge central power which is grinding the faces of the poor. Mankind in general are becoming drones and slaves to bureaucracy. Today in America, everyone suffers with the heavy burden of taxes, hidden taxes and national debts, which have been drained off in futile military blunders, Santa Claus giveaway programs and ridiculous spending. Our top heavy government has become a mammoth money monster, and the more it eats, the more it wants. This is the great society of modern Gentile civilization. It is enough to make anyone want to get out of it and join the United Order. Right bracket these are just some of the evils of a Gentile system which are a misery to its individuals, a detriment to a community, a wicked power in government, and a system despised by God.
but he has made the promise that he would overthrow the money changers in mine own due time, saith the Lord. D&C 117,16. The whole world is fast heading towards total socialism, and some have claimed that this worldly socialism and the united order have much in common, if not are really the same. However, consider the following illustration comparing socialism to the united order. Two men are living on two different islands. They have all they need for existence. They are not troubled by interferences from the outside world. There are no phones, no salesmen, no taxes to pay, and no worry about work, food, clothes or any debts. The only difference between the two is the amount of freedom they can enjoy. One is on a tropical island near Samoa, the other is at Alcatraz. United Order provides individual freedoms and is of God. Socialism is tyranny without freedom and comes from the devil. But the world and the Mormons have moved more towards socialism and tyranny than they have towards United Order and the principles of freedom. Brian Young described what will eventually happen to the nations of the world because of this great evil, and to the Latter-day Saints, too, if they continue to follow these worldly standards. There is one principle I would like to have the Latter-day Saints perfectly understand that is, of blessings and cursings. For instance, we read that war, pestilence right bracket, plague, famine, etc., will be visited upon the inhabitants of the earth, but if distress through the judgments of God comes upon this people, it will be because the majority have turned away from the Lord. Let the majority of the people turn away from the holy commandments which the Lord has delivered to us, and cease to hold the balance of power in the church, and we may expect the judgments of God to come upon us, but while six-tenths or three-fourths of this people will keep the commandments of God, the curse and judgments of the Almighty will never come upon them. JD 10.335. But today the saints are entwined into the great and wicked society of the Gentiles, Little or no effort is made to encourage the saints to leave Babylon and its system, nor to live the united order. The church has even gone further in defending the unrighteous system of the Gentile bureaucracy than other churches. In a message from the presidency of the church to all stake presidents in the United States. January 21, 1983. A member who deliberately refuses to pay state or federal income taxes, or to comply with any final judgment rendered in an income tax case, federal or state, is out of harmony with the basic teachings of the Church. Jurisdictional Journal, 2nd Quarter 1983, page 8. This creates a problem for the Latter day Saints who believe in obeying God's law of the United Order, the Constitution, and the principles of freedom. It is the final test of their integrity to see if they will obey true principles. Right bracket we live in a time of testing. Heber C. Kimball often prophesied of these events that we are now experiencing. His H.C.K. public discourses about this time were the most earnest and impressive that I had ever heard, and on several occasions in the Provo Meeting House, he clearly foreshadowed the time of trial the saints are now passing through, and to a period still before us. He often used the language, a test, a test, is coming. Life of Heber C. Kimball O. F. Whitney, page 445 and 447. The nature of this test was to see if the saints would draw more towards God and his laws, or towards the world and their evil system. Are the Mormons being drawn towards Wall Street or the United Order? Are they drawn towards destruction or the millennium? Isn't it evident that righteously living in united order would eliminate all the evils of our contemporary, contemptible, society? Every person should ask himself if he is building up the world or Zion. Jesus said we have, but two masters we must serve one or the other. And I say unto you, be one, and if ye are not one ye are not mine. D&C 38,27, a moment of reflection will show a less than optimistic view of our condition in the eyes of the Lord.